welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a rare case of being in the same time zone as me. <laughs> And creator of the upcoming RPG Cottages and Cerberus, the one, the one and only Christopher Pellick. How you doing today, man? I am doing pretty good. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Oh, this is a refreshing change of pace from de from dealing with time zones across the pond. <laughs> oh, I a hundred percent understand that. So, my my usual thing is op is opening up with the humble beginnings. It's kind of the tradition. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh man, I have, I I have non standard stories. That's not too weird, but uh, it's a bit different. Um, back in two thousand three, uh, I was a wee I was a wee young lad. And I was obsessed with the X-Men. I am still obsessed with X-Men comics. And there was this little book called Marvel's Universe Role-Playing Game, um, 2003. I did not know what a role-playing game was, but it fascinated me. This was a old, this was a diceless Marvel system. Mm -hmm. Very weird system. And then... I forgot about it, as you do. Um, me and my buddy then started, like, when I was in middle school, started playing a game. We basically reinvented Dungeons & Dragons. Mm -hmm. Then, a bit later, like, 8th grade, I formerly, um, we, there was Dungeon Ma Dragon Magazine mm -hmm. at our local library. And I was obsessed with that. I basically like reverse engineered the game and then that summer i got the actual thing and it's been an addiction ever since so were you were you more it is interesting that you bring up marvel um universe which in the in the lengthy history of the of various marvel ttrpgs from face rip to multiverse um Universe doesn't get a whole lot of t doesn't get a whole lot of talk, um, and I, in my not so humble opinion, it was it was um, it was kind it was kind of it was kind of screwed from the get go because of it being a not only being a diceless game but the fact that Marvel thought that they could compete with the recent really re recently released D and D third edition with it, which uh, yeah, um, it's a game that if it the I, I actually, as a game designer, it's a game I really learned a lot from. Like, I still go through. It's a interesting system. Absolute shit book. Um, like, that is the... That should be the level of you have really unique ideals that are not written well. Oh. So I did, I did a review of it a few years ago when I was... Cut, when I was... Um, cut when I, because... I thought about doing a retrospective of Marvel RPGs, but then I realized I'd already covered mo most of them except that one, so that's what I ended up going with. I had said that uh, having everything revolve around two resources was a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the of course the other thing that drove me up a wall was was the lack of an index. But any any game that doesn't have an index is going to piss me off. <laughs> Yep. But with that in with that in mind, um, were you more of a one system lifer after you formally discovered D and D, or were, or did no. you jump around between a bunch of different systems over the years? I definitely you no. Know, I had a bit of time where I was very focused on um, D and D three dash three point five. Um, through Path Pathfinder, um, a lot of my early experience was very much what we call lonely fun because there was just not lots of people interested. So it was a lot more 
interested in reading those books. And so mainly when it was that, I, when I was not really playing but just reading about these games, it was mainly D&D and Pathfinder. But once I regularly started playing games, I quickly got into like all of the systems. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, let's shift into Cottages and Cerberus. How did this particular idea come about? Was was this some was this something that you had been kicking around at your own tables for a while and just expanded out from there, or was there a different path? Um. So I've been I've been tinkering with games for a really long time. In the previous life, in my early twenties, I worked as a programmer and game designer at various video game studios doing various stuff like that um so i've always been designing games but they've mostly been for me i had a like ideal for something that i thought i wanted to get out but i was like i should publish something small and i was going to write a one-page rpg um and i was like monster hunter meets animal crossing that's funny Wrote a one-page RPG, hated it. Uh, liked a lot of the ideals, was not like I needed a bit more than that one page. And then 299 pages later, here we are. Mm -hmm. So, no, oh, you you mentioned it, you you mentioned um, wanting to do it as a one wanting to do it as a one page was. When you mentioned that you hated it, was it just that it just didn't um convey it didn't convey what you had wanted? Yeah, um, I really, um, like, a lot of genuine wisdom in the game design is start with something small and get it, like, completely packaged, and that's maybe good ideal, mm -hmm. but th that size of game does not interest me. I'm interested more in games that have a bit more crunch, bit more content, um, the very small page RPGs are just very, um, are basically just improv with a bit of guidance. Yeah, my, one of my colleagues calls that kind of calls those kind of games "Mother May I" games, and I've um, mm -hmm. I'm I myself have been, I've been very you. I'm not sure if you've seen if you've seen any of my past work, but I've been very critical of how some pe some people put wit put a bit too much romanticization on games with simple mechanics. And what I mean by that is the, is this idea that somehow um having simple mechanics is better because more because more role playing is the is the argument I often hear, but I will always counter that simplicity and complexity in that regard is like a pendulum. You can swing if you swing too far in the complexity end of things, you get some of those abominations that I saw back in the 90s. Oh, um, God. Like the original Alien RPG. Not the not the one by Free League. That's actually good. The, what, the one that was a... Um, that was a fork of Phoenix Command, which is high up on the games of I will not run unless I'm paid. Uh, not, to, not to be bribed off into, into running it, but hazard pay. <laughs> All right. Oh, and of course, on the other end, you have games that try that try and go so simple and just say we'll ju we'll just role play it, ignoring the fact that when you take that kind of approach, you end up in a you end up in a situation where you're throwing somebody into the deep end of the pool and telling them just swim, even if they can't. And then when they can't, you tell them, okay, stop drowning. Uh, I feel like we are. I feel. I feel like you've definitely looked through a good amount of the, the content I have because yes, I am very much like. I role playing is by far my um. Favorite um part of RPGs, but I would also rather role play in a Pathfinder 2e game than a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Um, these, sh um, they should. The rules, like, I want the game part of the RPG as well. Mm -hmm. I, for, for me, it's a, ca it's a case of, I can do both, but I'm also aware that not ev that not everybody um, is, is going to be good at improv. Mm -hmm. um, 
Even uh, even I even I kind of suck at improv theater, but when you when when you do that whole I'll oh, just I'll oh, just role play it and and put and put emphasis on that or emphasis on the so-called storytelling. Um, that is putting a bigger that is putting bigger pressure to fill in the blanks for people who may, maybe weren't theater kids. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I was to a point, but that's but that's beside the point. <laughs> I fully agree. Um, and because there's some people who just will do really good with that, but not all of them will, especially on the GM side. Um, so I can actually dive a bit into mm -hmm. cartridges and sabers here, but because mm -hmm. there's a few things where, like, I really think cartridges and sabers. But we were talking about simple games. I think this is a deceptively simple or maybe deceptively complex depending on how you want to look at it. The kind of design goal was for this to be a game that you could learn in a few minutes but then still like there's that crunch that you're kind of are keep learning and thinking about as you play the day after etc etc. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it came to the core mechanic, what I notice is that unless I'm misreading it, you're going for a um, aim high, um, success based D6 pool. Yep. Uh, with the the, um, the the I'd say the I'd say the core difference that I'm that I'm seeing is that is that the number that's needed um, isn't isn't set like it is in some d6 pools like say in something like Shadowrun um five fives and si fives and sixes are, actually no it was four fours and hires are success are hits everything else is misses um and you tr and if you get a if you get half if you if half the die show up as ones that's a glitch um I'm vastly simplifying of co of course but that's the general um, vibe with that one, but with that or with World of Darkness's dice pool and so and so on, the the um, number that you're supposed to be rolling out over in in order to get hits is always set. Whereas right. in your case, the what's effect what's effectively the TN for for that um, isn't set. Correct. And so the reason for that is because so you are looking for three successes, uh, three hits, essentially, mm -hmm. to succeed. Um, but then, kind of, when you if you have at least one, you can spend your health, we call it spoons from the spoon theory of mental health, um, mm -hmm. to turn a success, a failure, into a success. So you get a bit of this resource management here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd I'd say based on that description, the spoons would be um, CNC's extra effort mechanic. Yes, uh -huh. and it's limited. It's mm -hmm. uh, especially since you are also losing it when you take damage, so you are get starts dwindling pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in with that in mind. Um, I think the other thing that I n that I couldn't help but notice, and maybe maybe this was ins maybe this was directly inspired by Pathfinder 2e or something else, but with a lot of the abilities, you have them loosely built around a tag system. Yes, I do. Um, Pathfinder 2e is my game. Like it's the game that I play the most, um, or at least I played the most until I started running this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's a game that really mechanically character building, characters building specifically, it scratches a lot of things I like. And I think having the tags both is an easy way to tie some rules um, without having to constantly repeat them. But also, it's like looks interesting when you are flipping through, which is a really important thing as you learn a game. Those kind of eye catchers. Mm -hmm. 
And to that to that particular end, to that particular end, uh, when it when it comes to when it, when it comes to um, character creation, um, if I, if I understand if I understand it correctly, you're going relatively freeform. You're not really doing a whole lot in the way of um, in the way of arc in the way of archetypes. It's largely it's largely built around the four attributes and a set of um, abilities. Yep, that is correct. So we have um, what's not in the what's not in the preview I have up. There is a optional archetype system called cozy callings. They kind of take inspiration between classes and playbooks. But those are optional, just there's kind of a thing that comes up where we have, um, you choose three of, we are going to have like over 200 abilities in the final, in the final book. That takes a, that sometimes is overwhelming. So the cozy callings is kind of a way to just like 20 archetypes, 20 character ideals, and they have suggested abilities to choose from. So that really helps speed things up when you're, Running a one shot or something. Mm -hmm. So would would it be a when it comes to character creation? Would it be a case where you're setting up your core, your um core four abilities and then picking three, uh, or th sorry attributes? It's a old habit. Your core four attributes and then picking three um abilities. Almost. That part is right. You also pick two more things. You pick either a magic item. Or a pet, they basically go in like an attunement slot, basically. Mm -hmm. So you have to choose which one. Um, and then you get um, a vibe. A vibe is a special, um, is a special thing every character has that dictates how they regain spoons, regain their resources mm -hmm. throughout plays. So there is an extrovert vibe. Every time you start a scene with other people, in that scene, you regain one spoon. It's things like that. They are, and they are also kind of as like slight role playing props without getting too heavier and like pushing. They give just a bit of flavor, a bit of personality to the character, just from their mechanical perspective before you even get into their backstory and stuff. Mm hmm. Now, going further, going further in, because uh, I know, I know we, I know we had mentioned that the TN isn't exactly uh, set. Right. Uh, so, I think what I think the key th the key thing to a to ask on that front is the relationship between at between attribute and the die, and the die roll itself is it going to be determining um, how many die you're going to be rolling or is it determining the tn for the roll um that will be determining how many dice you are rolling so if you're trying to cr climb a tree and you have a target num um you have three muscles you will lo roll three dice Mm -hmm. And then add any bonus dice which you might have from circumstance bonus or special abilities. Mm -hmm. So, given that, what would you? What would the baseline TN be? Three. Three is kind of the medium difficulty. Um, most things are going to fall into that TN of three, mm -hmm. but. Some things are going to be very easy, which in case you're going through, you might be trying to get... Um, I feel like if you're attacking, you might really be trying to go not for just a success, but criticals. Um, but then some very high things could have, difficult things could have a target number of six, which also means having get that high means you have a chance of not even being able to succeed at the cost of spoons. Mm -hmm. Now... One of the big things that's highlighted in the preview is the is the creation of a cottage. Yes. And there's obviously a, a fair few downtime rules when it comes to it. 
Now, now within the preview, it talks about the cottage being it being kind of its own character, which does lead me to ask if, in the full book, you're going to be having a cottage sheet. We do have um our cottage sheet um by the same person who did our main character sheets, which is not um we don't have um empty versions in the preview yet, but we do have them up on the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have this little cottage sheet. You have a few rooms that you can doodle in and it has like just free spaces to write what is in the cottage. Mm -hmm. How do you get bonus cozy points? That type of thing. Yeah. And with now given now given that there's also the there's also the mention of a cottage rank. So I think what I think what I'd be curious about is what it is what exactly the party would get from advan from advancing the rank of their particular cottage. So the main thing they actually get is it's a way to trick people into caring about experience points again without being murder hobos. Um, when you rank up, you level up. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. There are also some small, but there's not a lot of setting in this world. I very much prefer world building where the system gives you a few hints that you can take and build around those. But one of the few things that is mentioned is there's a moon goddess that judges your cottage and when you reach certain ranks grants you something like cookies that will restore your spoons at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. And one of obviously one of the other um, meta currencies that's me that's mentioned is um, cozy points which if I understand this correctly can be used for advancement but can also be used to Acts as a separate sort of extra effort since it allows you to to reroll. Um, cozy coins and cozy coins just let you um, they're they're like hero points. They let you reroll foul dice. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to now, obviously the other ha obviously the other half is um mo is monster hunting. And since yes. since you brought up Monster Hunter in the um, initial kicks in the Kickstarter um, page, this is this is where there's a few things that I'm cu I'm curious about. One of them is the fact that any any time you're doing a hunt within the Monster Hunter games, a lot of it is a good amount of it is um, tracking down the thing using using the various kit that you have. At your disposal. In in something like CNC, how do you how do you replicate that chase of trying to of trying to find the monster that you're confronting? Every monster is different. Every monster has a hunt, which is basically a miniature adventure. You don't have to use it when you're running the game, but this also that you basically run a monster with no prep, and so. Every single monster is different. Some of them are very much just very basic. A series of tracking checks, that's all. Um, maybe if you do good, you can get ambushed. If you do bad, they will ambush you. Some of them have uh, more like kind of branching paths. Some of them have a lot of really unique... Um, one of them, for example, there's a mole monster, and you basically play a miniature game of whack-a-mole before you start the hunt, where you first track them down, and then you have to, like, choose which of nine holes it is hiding in, and you have a few chances every time you fail, it gets a free attack on you. So, every monster kind of has it. Every monster is different. Some of them go more in that mini-game style. Some are just basic check mm -hmm. some of them have all like full-on adventures yeah um oh. and look looking at the stat blocks i noticed that they oh, that they only have three um attributes um hide yes. resist and speed which yes given the presence of speed i i'd be remiss if i didn't ask do you 
Do you see C and C as a game that leans more towards grid combat or one that leans more towards theater of the mind? Um, so it is fully theater of the mind, actually. Um, I have found that you can gain, you lose only a tiny bit of tacticalness, um, strategic thinking, and you gain a lot of speed if you just get rid of grids. I played around with a optional grid rule. Didn't like it. So speed is actually, um, this is a update from the preview. Speed is actually the defense against range attacks. So like bows and arrows, guns, those type of things. So you'd need to get that many hits in order to, in, in order to, um, It's a target it's... number. Mm -hmm. ah. Yes. Yes. Oh. Um. Now... With that, in, with that in with that in mind, um, since since monster again since Monster Hunter has been invoked, I am curious if um if any if anyone in playtesting or otherwise has tried to bring in some of the more interesting armaments that Monster Hunter has become famous for, such as well, since since it because of. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up because it's become a running meme with my with my friend and I, the Switch Axe. Which she has affective, affectionately called the Swag Axe. Do um, I have no idea why. Surprisingly no. Um <laughs> uh, Weapons um so kind of relate to that. Weapons are largely um you have um mundane weapons you can just say like I have an axe mm -hmm. you can kind of reflavor your magical weapons as ever so but no stuff like that has not happened yet mm, give it time <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm certain and I'm guessing I'm guessing that the mix of hide resist and speed are in t are intended to be target numbers for diff yes. for different types of actions Yes, so hide is what you use like with your melee weapons attack. Resist is for is a target number against magic, and speed is a target number against range. Yeah. Now, when it comes to char when it comes to character weapons, would they ha would they end up um, writing it writing in whether or not whether or not it is of those three types? Yeah, um, that is very much kind of more narrative. So, because, like, if you have, like, a throwing a knife, you could stab or you could throw. So, it's one of those, like, it doesn't need to necessarily be said. It kind of, like, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh. Which, which will be very interesting if some, if somebody brings their own version of, of, say, or their own equivalent of, say, the insect glaive. Because of, because of how because of how interesting that particular kit is i mean i fully agree um it's kind of also it is designed a bit to um i'm really i'm trying to find that balance between having like r having very rigid rigid rules and having things where you just can't be like narratively balance it um and i think we've this is something where it just like makes sense usually and if not you can have a conversation in the game because i very much view these types of games partially as conversations mm -hmm. now with but e even with that even even though magical effects are there um I am I'm a bit I'm a bit curious as to the dividing line when it comes to some of the abilities as presented in the list, um, specifically the difference between, um, I guess the difference between a power ability and a action ability. Um, where do you where do you draw the where do you draw the line? Is is it just that power abilities are meant to be magical in nature? Or is it something so, else? So, power abilities are a more of a design philosophy of being free form versus rigid rules. So, you could have a fire spell. The fire spell explicitly tells you what it does. 
kind um whereas the fire control ability does not tell you what what it does so it's kind of that people trying to use fireball to set things on fire in dnd for example um and so we have some additional rules and powers that kind of get give some the game masters guidelines about how to do rules and rulings and we've also are like we mentioned you can ban all power abilities if you want if you don't want this more free form form approach to role playing it's very much just trying to cater to different types of tables different type of players mm-hmm. now given the Given that, given that, I'd be remiss if I didn't if I didn't bring up how a an arrow might have someone's name on it, but a fireball only reads to whom it may concern. All right. <laughs> or you, or you could be like one of my one of my buddies who seems to have this the idea that you can ne- you can never have enough grenades. Or or in one case, enough alchemist fire because. Hey, no, nobody can on a stealth operation, and his response was, "Nobody can notice if nobody's left alive to notice." I mean, that's not untrue. It is, it's technically correct, but it's still but it's still wrong because, or just, again, this supposed to be a sneaking mission, and his idea of sneaking is to set half of the building on fire. I mean, it worked, but at what cost? Exactly. But with that, with that in mind, um, I know now. Um, even though there's, like, even though you have plans for about 50, for at least fifty or so monsters, um, I am, cu- I am curious if you have any plans on putting in um, some sort of conversion guide, since you are putting in support for. Pathfinder Second Edition and D and D Fifth Edition. If there's, if there, within that within that kind of support, if there's plan, if there's any um, plans on helping out with the reverse or bringing monsters from either of those games into the rule set of C and C. Um, we'll see. That would that would have to fall under. Um, that would most likely fall under the. Um, rule those individual conversion guides, and that's going to really largely depend on page counts. There's um, CNC is mostly done. There's a mm-hmm. few. Um, I'm waiting on some editing. There's some few new extra content unlocked through the Kickstarter, but like, we are doing editing. Um, there's a few things out, getting some minor rewrites, but like. The that game is mostly done. The conversion guides are like seventy percent done with each of them. There's a few, so exact page count I'm less sure sure about. Mm-hmm. And given th- given that, when it com- when it comes to when it, when it comes to the development, were there were there any concepts that you had um, that you that you had conceived of early on, but as the game develops, kind of got kind of got evolved out of it? Yeah, there there are a few. Um, there was a lot of it really like basic match days. Um, when I started this, like you know, uh, well, we actually do still have the basic dragon, but at some point we I did un I did get rid of the dragon and I rewrote it. Um just very basic, like not unique monsters. And the more I started to play around with things, the more I figured out I really like some weird shit. Like I like monsters that are different. Um for like we have some silly ones like the explodey cat, which is a cat. That is also a bomb. Um, you and uh, we have a boar potato, which is a cross between a potato and a boar. Um, but we also have some monsters that are like have some really messed up backstories and lore, lore as well. And that is a lot more interesting than just generic beast number five. Mm-hmm. And so, 
we had the Chimera. Um, that was like one of the face masters I wrote. I got rid of that like months ago. There was a like Shadow Panther. Wasn't really feeling it. There was a a lot of the others have um survived in some way or another. Mm-hmm. I can see. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that since while a while a chimera might be might be fit, might be fitting in in a in a roundabout way, it's all it's also a little bit obvious. And what I've note what I noticed with the um with the end with the monsters that you put into the preview is that very few of them are what are what would be considered that same level of um, obvious. Uh, I think the ones in the previews are actually the more more normal of a lot of the monsters. Mm -hmm. um, some of the stuff that have not been released yet are a bit stranger, a bit weirder, um, play with the systems a lot more. Yeah. And of course, of course, there are I couldn't help but notice that some of them have the deadly tag attached to them, and some of them do not. Is that more of a measure of how, of how daunting that particular challenge might be? Yeah. So to start off, uh, this is a cute little game. This game is actually really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no death. You don't even knock out when your spoons get um, reduced to zero. You stay up, you just basically get disadvantage on everything you attempt. Then, if ever, if the entire party gets there, you are first to retreat. You just, your, your fighting spirit has been obliterated and you can't go on as a group anymore until you have to recoup. So that means I don't have to be nice. As a game designer, this is a game that, you know, it's not the crunchiest game. You should always kind of feel like your back is a, is a bit against the wall. Um, th There's a podcast that actually is doing an actual play, uh, like, and I'm not in it, so this is, like, the first game where I have, like, the first game of the system where I have no hands in it, and listening to them... Everyone was freaking out because in the first combat, two thirds of the people were knocked out of. They were reduced to zero spoons. The final person had like two spoons left. These are really hard monsters. Deadly monsters basically means that level one you have zero chance of succeeding. Mm hmm. And. With that, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as the total page count? About three hundred. It probably is going to um go over three hundred right now because we had some backers, um, some tiers. We have backers um, at the highest tier can collaborate with me to add a monster to the book and. We are adding quite a few monsters because of that, so it's going to be like 300, 320 pages. Mm -hmm. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the PDF version? I know the printed versions can be a particular brand of a hassle. Um, I am hoping for this year. We'll see. Um, um There's a few possible bottlenecks that I could possibly see um, happening. Um, l I am hoping to get everything edited by like mid-November and then that would mean we would have like a, maybe a month to finish layouts. Um, hopefully we're going to start the final rounds of layouts here and work in tandem with the editors. So hopefully like mid-December right before Christmas uh, most likely we're going to get for the print release we're going to get hit by Chinese Chinese New Year and the shutdown on that side of the continent uh, side of the world mm -hmm. 
Well, it it it's it's one of those things that can that always can happen. Yep. But it in lieu of that, you probably couldn't hear it, but that was me knocking on wood because I don't want I do not want to tempt the gods of irony. For real. But no, I'm very confident that if we don't get this out this year, the PDF, it will come out like the face week of next year. Yeah, or the first few weeks of next year. We're pretty far. It's like I said, I'm mostly done. Um, it's editing, which is always takes longer than you would like to. Every, everyone always thinks it's only going to take a few minutes. Which is about which is about as ridiculous as someone playing Civilization for only five minutes. Yeah, no, uh, especially when you're writing it, you can really delude yourself into thinking that yeah, that's not the big task, and you are very wrong. Oh, uh, and you've done programming, so you're probably familiar with the programmer's drinking coat, the pro programmer's yes. drinking um, song. You know. 99 little bugs in the code, 99 bugs in the code, you take one down, you patch it around, 287 bugs in the code. Yeah, no, very, very familiar with that. <laughs> I end up using that joke a lot, but I'll stop using that joke when it stops applying. <laughs> so, so you won't stop using it. Well, to be fair, even if I was told to stop, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't stop anyways, because... So many, so many um, programmers I know hate it because they can't argue with it. It's very true, sadly, sometimes. Well, truth is the gr truth is the greatest comedy. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and and enjoy the madness that happens here. Thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!